Yes, spin launch yet a second busting video. Because sometimes you're sitting there afterwards thinking, hang on, that can't be right. And then you check it and yeah, that's not right. So a quick summary of the story behind spin launch, because it's amazing. A guy with no experience with rockets or satellites was sitting there one day thinking, I wonder how I can revolutionize launching satellites. That was the inspiration for spin launch. We basically asked the question, is there a way to get to space without a rocket? I really took a look at it from just a fresh perspective and that's when the idea of a rotational accelerator came up. And he came up with the idea of spinning the satellite into space. Amazing. You would have thought that such a great idea would have come from the minds of engineers. But apparently, no. Regular engineers don't think of these sorts of things. This was just a regular guy sitting there one day and boom, $100 million startup. Maybe if he'd have just had a, a deeper voice and a black turtleneck sweater and told everyone he was a Harvard dropout, boom, $9 billion startup. But... It all worked so amazingly in the computer-generated graphics. Everything was so clean in the computer-generated graphics. You just spin it up like a giant trebuchet and hope it doesn't blow itself apart. And then you just lob something out and the motor kicks in and takes it all the way up into space. Except that's not how physics work. 100% that's not how physics work. You see, you know these a liquid fed engines because you can see the fuel and the propellant tank. So in order to actually pump the stuff out of there, you need a force pushing it to the bottom of the tanks. But wait, this yeeking machine is dumb fire. These projectiles are unpowered, which means they're always slowing down due to the atmospheric drag. So imagine we've got a projectile sat on the ground. The liquid sits in the fuel tank, looks very much like this. Then when we throw it into the air, of course, now it's slowing down due to the atmospheric drag, which means the fuel will be pushed against the front of the fuel tank. So you need a way of getting the fuel to the bottom of the fuel tank. And the way this is usually done is with things called oolage motors. So you fire out the oolage motors for a little bit to accelerate the rocket, and that settles the fuel. Then you can use the rocket to accelerate in a normal fashion. But apparently the $100 million startup company hasn't quite thought of basic rocket concepts like that. Sure, they have a little motor to derotate the missile, but they have no oolage motors on this thing. It just magically fires up somehow, which is something that happens a lot in computer-generated graphics. Now, I had seen claims that they were launching things at six times the speed of sound, and I just assumed that the reporters had got confused or something. But no, apparently it's on their website from the frequently asked questions on the Spin Launch website. The orbital accelerator spins up to approximately 5,000 miles per hour prior to releasing the launch vehicle. To date, we've conducted tests at over six times the speed of sound. This is straight out bullshit. I mean, you know the size of this centrifuge. It's about 30 meters in diameter, which means it's about 100 meters around the outside. So let's count how many revolutions this thing's doing per second. Seven, six, five, four. Uh, okay, isn't this meant to be in a vacuum? So why can I hear it going whoosh, 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 Doppler style? Five, four. Okay, that's a bit fast. Let's try that again with a time code. So let's start when the arm is over here. And so there's one full revolution in about a third of a second. There is two for all revolutions in about 0.6 of a second, and it's about three revolutions per second, which puts their velocity at about 300 meters per second, which is about the speed of sound, not six times the speed of sound, about a thousand miles per hour, or as it was reported in CNBC, uh, quoting spin launch, their initial test was accelerated to many thousands of miles per hour using approximately 20% of the accelerator's power capacity. Then I got into the comparison with the battleship gun. You see, yeah, a heavy battleship gun, 100-year-old technology, could launch a projectile with very high accuracy. Even under ideal circumstances, you could see only about 14 miles from the deck of a battleship. But with these ships 20 miles apart, it's possible to land a salvo of 16-inch projectiles accurately on the target. 
Now, the typical muzzle velocity of a big gun like this was about two and a half times the speed of sound. But if you were brave, you could charge them up to about three times the speed of sound. Now, Spin Launch wants to do that by spinning things up to, well, currently the speed of sound and can launch things with dubious accuracy. I mean, you only have to look at how crooked the projectile comes out of their chamber. It's, it's at an angle of about 30 degrees or something. Plus, for the chamber to be loaded, it has to be done in a vacuum because otherwise you would generate too much frictional heating and it would take too much power. So you have to evacuate the chamber every time. And realistic times for that are probably in the eight hour region. Well, battleship guns, of course. Slamming into a target at the rate of two a minute from each gun, they can do plenty of damage. An outstanding case where it's better to give than to receive. So currently, our standard 100-year-old battleship gun outclasses spin launch by a factor of 3 in velocity, which is a factor of 10 in energy. And that would, of course, be assuming they weighed the same. They don't. Functioning battleship shells weighed about a ton, whereas the proposed spin launch missiles will weigh about 200 kilos. So it's more like a factor of 50 in muscle energy. And of course, the battleship gun could fire every 30 seconds versus eight or so hours for spin launch. So the battleship gun could fire about a thousand times faster. Now you stack all the irrelevant factors here and spin launch is some 50,000-ish times worse than a regular battleship gun in terms of how much energy it can launch. So you see already in the comparison to a gun not designed for this purpose, spin launch has an awful lot of catching up to do. But what about the G-forces, I hear you ask? Doesn't shooting something out of a gun cause incredible damage to sensitive electronics? Well, yeah, sometimes. For certain, if you're talking delicately folded satellites, subjecting them to 10,000-ish G in a centrifuge is going to be harsh. But isn't that the same with a gun? Well, actually, the peak loadings are comparable, with the exception that firing a projectile like this takes a fraction of a second whilst a centrifuge is going to be spun up over the best part of an hour, so it's going to have a prolonged time at these high G loadings. So, for instance, a lot of people would consider a nuke a fairly precision piece of engineering, in that the shaped explosive charges need to be triggered with millisecond, microsecond, that sort of thing, timing in order for a plutonium implosion device to function properly. Uh, fairly sensitive stuff. Yet the US military devised a version of this that could be fired from a cannon. Now, if your immediate thought was, whoa, that has to be fake. Well, kinda, yeah. In the, we know the muscle velocity here is about two times the speed of sound. That's 600 meters per second or two kilometers every three seconds. And this has to go about 10 kilometers away before it's going to explode. So we expect the time of flight here to be about 15 seconds. So let's see what it actually is. So here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, ho, ho. something's not right here. And of course, you go through it and you take a look at, well, just, just watch the, watch the smoke here. Smoke here, smoke here, smoke here, smoke here. Oh, and all of a sudden the smoke vanishes. And also, uh, you, you'll notice that after the explosion, there are smoke trails. Uh, these are rockets that they always put up, by the way, when they were testing the nukes. You can actually see where the pressure wave is by it moving the smoke trails on the rockets. So immediately prior to launch, um, to detonating the nuke, they would fire these rockets up. And you'll notice that, oh, they're not there yet. They're not there yet. They're not there yet. So I went and took a look around to see if I could find the actual original footage. And... Since no gun type assembly had been detonated since the Hiroshima bomb, the weapons development scientists had on this shot their first opportunity to study the nucleonic behavior and fireball configuration of such a device. 
Yes, that awkward silence that you have between when you fire the nuke and you've got 15 seconds to kill before you've got something else to talk about. Also fun to note is that while the shell is traveling away from us at about two times the speed of sound, once the nuke detonates, the majority of the sound wave coming back only travels at the speed of sound. So the shell takes roughly 15 seconds to go out and it will be another 30 seconds before you hear the bang from the explosion. Yeah, so uh, not like this. And they weren't the only ones or the first ones to think this way. Way back in World War II, Germany had three V weapons. The V1, a flying bomb with a pulse jet engine. The V2, a rocket, and the V3, basically a giant artillery piece. Well, it was a little more sophisticated than that. It was meant to be an accelerating gun. Which gets over the fact that, you know, when you basically fire a gun, you have high pressure in the cylinder at first, which very effectively accelerates the shell. But as it moves down the barrel, the pressure decreases. So a way to get around this is you have extra charges that go off just after the shell has passed it and therefore accelerate the shell even more. Now, there are other ways around this that rather than setting up extra charges, you have slower burning propellants, which maintain the pressure in the barrel. Now at that point, the final muzzle velocity depends on how long the barrel is. So obviously if you can make the barrel longer, you can accelerate things faster. And this is what was done with Project HARP, High Altitude Research Project. A project that amazingly enough, Spin Launch make reference to because it turns out to be a massive cell phone in every conceivable way. So I looked at the whole problem. I came across Project HARP. They were closer than anybody else has ever come to actually building an alternative to rockets. They were able to accelerate a projectile out of a gun tube at speeds of excess of 5,000 miles per hour. I mean, you can imagine. The second people look into this, they find out that the entire sales pitch of Spin Launch is we're going to be a $100 million startup that is going to make a worse copy of something that was done 50 years ago. I mean, you know what spin launch is meant to do? It's meant to launch a projectile weighing about 200 kilos at about 5,000 miles per hour, 2,000-ish meters per second, about seven times the speed of sound, experiencing a maximum G loading of about 20,000 Gs. Well, Project Harp could launch a projectile weighing some uh, <coughs> 200 kilos, uh, about 2,000 meters per second, experiencing a lower G load of about 15,000 Gs. But, of course, for a fraction of a second in the barrel, rather than over an extended period of time in a centrifuge, the centrifuge's electric motor will spin the tethered rocket for an hour to build up speed. Once the rocket is ratcheted up to speed at over 5,000 miles per hour, the release mechanism will cut the vehicle loose and let it fly through the 35-degree launch tunnel. And, of course, the gun could be fired quickly. It could be fired as quickly as you could reload the gun. And Project Heart was really a bargain basement attempt at this. Yeah, I mean, you know what they used for the barrel? Two battleship guns stuck together. And the only people I know of who've seriously revisited the idea of the supergun since was Saddam Hussein with the Iraqi supergun. Made in Britain. Sheffield Steel, second to none. Well, at least they would have been made in Britain had the parts not been intercepted by customs who were wondering why these are petrochemical reactors, which were curiously straight tubes that could be bolted together to make a gun, were so massively over-designed and didn't have any other fittings on them. Interestingly, the designer was the same guy who did Project Harp, one Gerard Bull, who was shortly afterwards assassinated in Brussels. Yeah, so Saddam Hussein had a baby version with comparable range to the German V3, and a bigger version, which was never completed, which would have had almost infinite range. But of course, it couldn't really be aimed or moved, which made it of limited use as a weapon. Well, not entirely. As the shell flies through the air, you can steer it somewhat using aerodynamic forces, that sort of thing. Anyway, the practical upshot, firing projectiles like this has been technology for more than half a century. The centrifuge essentially does exactly the same thing, but is worse on any comparable metrics, with probably the most important one being is that Project Harp actually existed. Uh, it existed in reality. 
not as a computer simulation. That is, we're comparing the results of a real super gun to the aspirational goals to a startup by someone who has no background in this sort of thing. I mean, if we compare their actual achievements, they can't even outclass artillery. And even if we compare their aspirational goals, they are worse on every metric compared to Project Harp. The most notable one being its abysmal refire time, because you would have to pump down the chamber to a vacuum so you can spin something up to hypersonic speeds for about an hour without it overheating. And of course, if the device malfunctions in any way whatsoever, well, you're just going to have to build another facility. Whilst Project Harp used something as technologically advanced as a big, thick metal straw. But I guess on the upside, at least Spin Launch didn't claim that it was so good that it was actually banned. But what if we could store hydrogen as a solid on the cheap? A startup may have a solid technology that could speed up the energy transition. And spoiler, it's so good that it was actually banned. And spoiler, this is one of the most scientifically illiterate videos that I've ever seen. And I debunk creationists. And if you want to know why uh, solid hydrogen is a scam that makes spin launch seem like a sane, rational, well thought out idea, well, maybe consider hitting the subscribe button now because it's next on the busting block. And as ever, if you really like this video and want to support this channel directly, you can do it through Patreon. And uh, thanks for watching.